Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another video. Today we're going to be going over John's World War II uh, paratroop impression kit. Uh, we've talked about before that John is an aficionado about World War II, um, but what you guys don't know is that John is actually a history honors student. Uh, he's doing his honors project on reenactment as a form of living memory, and he's also worked on archaeological digs um, in Canada but also in France. This is not just something John is interested in, it's really a passion and something he's studied. And John's kit is actually very, very accurate. And I'm gonna let John do a lot of the talking because he knows a lot about this kind of stuff and we want to share some of his knowledge with you uh, to show you a little bit about how his impression came together. Hopefully you found it interesting, it's not our usual content, but uh, I know I've learned a lot just by um, getting you to walk, walk me through your kit. So I'm really excited for you to go through this uh, with uh, with everyone here and to, to break it down. So let's get to it. So tell us a little bit about specifically what your impression is. Sure, well uh, I'm representing a first Canadian parachutist uh, from I guess you could say June 6th to June 7th, 1944, so D-Day. Um, this is, by and large, what most of the boys were dropped in with, um, plus or minus a few items. Uh, so, yeah, this, this kit took about three years to come together and a whole lot of cheddar. Uh, so, with that in mind, we'll go from head to toe talking about all the kit that you see here. Uh, and it's going to be a long one, boys, so... Buckle up. Yeah, so I guess first off, my first question is, is any of the stuff that you're wearing actually original from uh, World War II? It's a good question. There's a lot on this kit that is original. Uh, a lot of it has dates, which is, as a collector and a reenactor, you kind of strive for finding original items with a date. Um, so I guess the first thing right off the bat is the helmet itself. This is a kind of a mix between a reproduction and a original. So the shell itself is a original. And now this could be either a tanker shell, um, so from 1944 on, 1943-1944 on, the British Armored Corps had uh, these dome-like helmets. Um, if you watch the camouflage video, it's the exact same shell as that. Uh, you can't really tell because of all the scrim. Uh, and this is a Mark II parachutist helmet, known in the reenactors field as a HSAT, Helmet Steel Airborne Troops, but not officially known as that within the historical, academic historical research. Um, so the liner itself is a reproduction. It's made by a fella, uh, Steve Kittle, uh, Pegasus Militaria, and so is this Denison smock. But going back to the original items, uh, my web gear, the 37 pattern British web gear, or in this case Canadian, is all original except for the entrenching tool um, and the bayonet frog. So most of what the core of the kit is, is original. I'm also wearing a 30, nine pattern uh, battle dress tunic here or surge and that's original dated april 1945 it's canadian manufacture so yeah so you've got a lot on here that's original that's actually dated from world war ii you've got some stuff that's uh you know some faithful reproductions um so it's obviously a good uh, impression of it in terms of what it looks like what about what it feels like is it really heavy oh yeah i mean this is fully loaded except for minus ammunition uh, yeah, I'd say the kit probably weighs anywhere from 75 to 80 pounds. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not mobile and it's not, a f it's not really that comfortable or modular like most of the stuff that we talk about on the channel, but, um, I mean, this is what won the war from the, uh, the Western Allies perspective, sorry. Um, so do you want to just quickly turn around? So this is the front. Obviously you have a whole small pack set up and the entrenching tool on the back. On his front you've got, you know, mag pouches. You've got what we commonly know as like webbing, uh, his kit. On the back uh, you have you got, uh, have a gas mask container here if I'm not mistaken. Yep, this is a light anti-gas respirator. And then going around again all the way, uh, you've got your, this is your gas cape I think is what yep. you said. Yep. Uh, we've got an entrenching tool. You've got this rope here. Uh, yep. This is called a toggle rope. What it actually does, uh, John going to describe it a little bit later but it's actually really interesting and you've also got your pack here with that will contain your like your rations as well as uh your mess can uh and anything else in there your shave kit your... yeah there's a there's a few items in there there's a you'll, we'll see it eventually uh it's the, the housewife kit and the wash roll um as well as a spare pair of socks and some other goodies so we're going to start looking at the items in a bit more detail i think what you guys will see is there's all the detail is there. So, I mean, whether you're talking about what you're seeing here, and there's all kinds of stuff inside and underneath that you can't see on camera, we're gonna go through, but it's all faithful, right? It's exactly what you would have seen. Uh, so yeah, so let's get started. Just before we do that, this yep. is, uh, you'll see a lot of pictures if you're familiar with the Second World War, Canadian Brit British uh, parachutists. Uh, they would have been used, typically would have been using the Stenmark 5, so with, with a wooden 
uh, stock with a Warden pistol grip, Warden foregrip, uh, and Lee Enfield 303 number four sights. Uh, but this is a Mark II configuration just for airsoft because they don't make a Mark V yet, which sucks. But once they do, it'll be on this kit. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so this is the, it's a very good rifle. It's all stock. Uh, only now running some issues with it now that I got the whole kit put together. So let's have a look at your helmet first. Yeah, so we got, what we got ourselves here is a Mark II parachutist helmet. Um, so the shell uh, is original. It's uh, kind of based, the British uh, mid-war, so, well, early war, 1942, they introduced the airborne troops and they needed a parachutist helmet to go with it because as you know, in the helmet video that we did on scrimming, I had a Mark II British steel helmet, which is kind of like that Brody shape. So it's a flat rimmed with a little dome on the top. Believe it or not, that's not very ergonomical for parachuting. Mm -hmm. So the British just didn't make the rim and they just made the, the dome. Uh, so the, like I said, the shell is original. It could be either be a parachutist steel helmet itself or it could be an armored core helmet. I'm not really sure. There's really no way of distinguishing the two now. Inside we have a uh, webbing chin strap and a leather chin strap itself with brass fittings. Uh, we have a, a very, uh, I would say primitive suspension system there uh, with a foam bump plate at the top there. So if you struck your head or anything exiting the aircraft, you would uh, have some sort of protective measure so it wouldn't be bone on steel. Uh, there's also some Sorbo film or foam going around the, that, which is right behind the liner or the leather liner. The sweatband, also known as, and uh, yeah, that's essentially the helmet. Great. So the next item of kit that we have here is the Sten Bandolier. So this is a specific airborne troop item. Uh, it holds seven magazines of the 32 round Sten Mark V or any variant of the Sten really, or MP40 magazines. So in this case, I have it loaded up with seven AGM MP40 magazines, I should say. Um, and attached to that, I have a shell dressing. This is a reproduction from Soldier of Fortune, which is a UK-based reproduction company. It's all right. I mean, it's not the best reproduction, but I mean, it looks the part and that's all that matters. And there is a bandage in there. So what would this have been used for? So that just would have been used on pretty severe chest or any wound really, because there's two types of field dressings that I have on this impression. A first field dressing and then this. Um, the shell dressing is for bigger wounds. Uh, there's a bigger bandage and that's about it. It's just kind of a, a, a primitive bandage type of situation. All right, so the next piece is gonna be? The toggle rope. Okay. So as you saw when I did that little 360 there, you saw this very thick rope. So this rope, uh, I mean, it looks outlandish, but it serves a functional purpose, uh, not for airsoft or reenacting really, only if you're jumping out of an aircraft, uh, which I'm not doing right now. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, it's true to the kit and uh, it's historically accurate. So what this would have been used for is where I'm representing a parachutist, uh, if they were to, to land in a tree, uh, they had no way down, uh, they would unhook, unhook that and they would drop it down and they would kind of rappel down that way. Very primitive, but it works. But uh, on a larger scale, you can see this being used in commando units as well. Uh, and they would just tie these together. So they would attach it like so to make a knot, but this would, just picture another rope here. So you would have 24 feet of rope uh, with two connected and you would be able to make makeshift bridges just so you're not going through water. So uh, what else you got? What's next? Uh, we got the light anti-gas respirator. Okay. So this is an original uh, British manufacturer anti-gas item. So inside here we have a Dutch unissued filter and an unissued 1944 dated light anti-gas respirator to be true to the lexicon. Not really used upon landing in Normandy or Operation Varsity. They would have just ditched that and used it as a general purpose pouch. So you can stick a whole whack of mags in here, a couple bombs. I mean, anything to your heart's content, really. And this respirator ties into actually this piece of material you have on your shoulder, right? Yep. So uh, as Phil just alluded to, um, this thing on my shoulder is the, the gas facade. So. All invading troops on D-Day would have been issued one of these. They would have varied in color from nation to nation. So with this British one, what happens, it's just a sewn cardboard material. It's rather uncomfortable to get on. Uh, so when the boys would land, that, that they would notice that that would change, then that's the presence of gas. So they would know to ditch their helmets, put on the respirator, 
and away you go. You see a lot of pictures, especially with like uh, 101st Airborne, if you watch Band of Brothers, all the boys are wearing the American equivalent to this uh, facade. Uh, Saving Private Ryan is also featured pretty heavily because you're watching the, uh, the 2nd Ranger Battalion land on Omaha and they would have been issued a gas facade, but again, the US version. All right, so next up, I think we're looking at your small pack. Is that right? Yep. So my small pack is a Dutch post-war variant, which is virtually the exact same as a wartime British or Canadian example. Um, the only difference is there's dividers in the wartime British ones and Canadians. Uh, just this one doesn't have them. So there would be a divider going across the back and then one down the center. So at the front of the pack, there would be two dividers. And then on the back, so the part that's resting on my back would be one, one separate container. So inside those two dividers at the front, it would go either the two mess tins or a water bottle and then a mess tin, the series of two mess tins. Um, or you can just wear the water bottle on your person attached to the web. And that's what I have done. Okay. And your small pack actually connects to your webbing, right? Yeah. So the small pack, uh, attached to the small pack, there's two L straps. There's a left and the right. So what happens with that is this buckle here attaches to the buckle on the universal pouches. Um, and you just unclip those. Typically, when you had a rest area, you would ditch the small pack and you would go out in what is known as your fighting kit. So this is how the ordinary Canadian parachutist or British parachutist went into combat. And we'll go through the contents of your small pack now uh, in a few moments and we'll really get into the detail because you also have a faithful reproduction of the contents of the small pack which is super super cool. Yeah. So it, that being said, what else do you got on your person here? You've got some magazine pouches. Yeah, so in so on the webbing, the 37 pattern webbing, um, you have some nice crisp buttons uh, that hold two Bren magazines. These are reproductions from Marshall's arsenal, or armory, sorry. And so you're not using a Bren. Why are you carrying Bren magazines? So the way the British section or Canadian section uh, is divided is they rotate around the general purpose machine gun. In this case, it's the Bren or the Bren Mark II. So every man in the section would carry 303 rounds in a Bren magazine to feed the machine gun. The British section is predominantly revolving around a base of fire element, which is the Bren gun. So each section, I think there would be two Bren guns. So each man in this section would carry the Bren magazines, at least two of them. Assistant Bren gunners would carry the barrel bag. So they would have two and it's most, in some cases, four additional Bren magazine pouches. Wow, okay. So, I mean, you're really revolving around that kit. So and which extra is, weight, too. Exactly. The good thing about that is the British, the Enfield number 4 Mark One was chambered in 303 as well. So in a dire situation, the regular riflemen would give up their individual rifle ammunition to feed the Bren gun because the whole squad, like I said, is dependent on that machine gun for the base of fire. Okay. So in this one, I have a beret... Uh, it's from What Price Glory. It's a pretty good reproduction. Uh, it's not the best on the market, but it does the job. I personally don't wear it because I go for a combat kit and I like to wear the helmet just for protection. And then in here, I have number 82 Gammon Bomb. So this is a uh, impact grenade. It's used for taking out heavy guns like a Flak 88, Flak 36, anti Panzers or gun emplacements. Uh, you just twist the cap and you just throw as well as I have a number 36 Mills bomb that's a reproduction that I got off Facebook and I got the Gannon bomb from What Price Glory and they make the best on the market. This is uh, just a resin cast of a Mills bomb. I have it taped up just so the spoon doesn't fly out. It's just obviously inert, so it's not going to blow myself or any of my friends up. Um, and it's called a Mills bomb, but it's essentially a fragmentation grenade? Exactly, yeah. And that's what those perforations along the sides are. They're, when the grenade would explode, these would, these small rectangles and squares would shoot out. Into shrapnel. Creating, yeah, shrapnel. All right, so that's your webbing on the front. What do you got around back on the webbing? So, yeah, the front of the webbing, I'm going to go to the right side. Here I have my uh, water bottle. Uh, in American lexicon, it's known as the canteen. The canteen in the British lexicon is where you go to eat. So it's there, it holds two pints. Uh, this is an original. There was a bit of rust in there, so I put some um, beeswax in there, melted some beeswax, and I coated the interior of the liner 
Water tastes like beeswax now, which is not bad. Yeah, I remember you telling me it tastes original too. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's a lot better than drinking rust. All right, so let's look at the back of your webbing right now. So if you just want to turn around. Sure. I know uh, this is, you've got your gas cape, you've got your entrenching tool, and we've got a bayonet here on your uh, left-hand side. You've got your, you were just showing us your water bottle on your right-hand side. So yeah, so uh, gas cape, entrenching tool, and bayonet. All right, so why don't you talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah, the gas cape, I'm not sure if it was used extensively in Normandy through for the first can para, but I know... Uh, in later operations, like Operation Varsity of March of 1945, uh, they use there's original photographs showing men with uh, the gas cape tied to their persons. I just have it here just so I have it. It's a reproduction from What Price Glory. It would be used if the in conjunction with the gas mask and if the gas facade changed color. So you just drop that over your person, and there's a cutout at the back so it would house your small pack. Uh, also, it was used, not traditionally, but it was used as a poncho, so to speak, just because the British parachutist wasn't really issued with a rain cape or anything like that on a large scale like the infantry were. Okay. And what about the e-tool? Yeah, I got this, uh, this entrenching tool from Soldier of Fortune. It's just a pick. So what would happen, you would slide the entrenching tool up, the, like the, the shovel part and the pick, and it would just, through tension, would kind of hold its shape. Uh, and you would just kind of scrape like that and pull. Very crude, but it's effective and it's not overly uncomfortable like the American stuff. And you also have a bayonet on your left side, right? Yep. So this is an original number four, the infield number four mark one bayonet, uh, the spike variant. So it's not, they do away with like the, the 12 inch sword style bayonet you see the SMLEs worn and used in the First World War. I mean, they were used up until like 1941 when the number four mark one were introduced. Uh, but this is, a, like I said, an original, but you're probably asking yourself, why do I have a number four bayonet on my person? Uh, if you see original photographs, the Sten Mark V actually has a bayonet lug for this bayonet on it, so you just attach it to the front, clip it down. So most original photographs that show the, the boys with the, the bayonet on their Sten guns are from the first para at Arnhem, so Market Garden, September 1944. Not really used in... Normandy, from what I know from pictures, but it's a good item to have just in case. So yeah, so next let's uh, let's take the uh, the webbing off, and I guess we'll see what uh, the rest of your kit. So I know you've got the Denison smock. Um, I'm excited to get into that one. So the web gear goes actually through your epaulets, right? Yep. All right. So let me give you a hand with that, yeah, since it's uh, uh, easier for an assistant to do that definitely. for you. And we'll get the other one. All righty. Normally you'd have one of the boys in your platoon helping you out. Yeah, yeah. That's all you can do. All right. So you'll see as I take it off, that it's khaki on the underside. This is because the web gear itself has been blankoed. And the blanco is a very traditional British uh, method to clean the equipment. So it's just a, a concealment method because they didn't have the technology, I assume, at the time to print all the grab fabric on mass. So uh, Blanco was the next step, next best bit. As it's original Blanco, it leaves your hands covered in green dust. Um, not very clean, but it gets the job done and it's accurate. Yeah, not one of the concern when you're in the field, right? No, exactly. You want it as much dirt as you can. So now you have a, a reproduction denizen. Yeah, so probably the most iconic piece of kit on this impression is the denizen smock. So. This is a airborne staple. If you're going to portray the airborne British or Canadian, you have got to have a Denison smock. This is a first pattern Denison smock. Um, later variants had a seam going down the front as well as button, uh, button cuffs, not this wool cuff. Um, this is a hand dyed, true to original uh, smock. So the method of application for the camouflage was uh, we assume, like collectors and historians of the Denison smock, kind of assume that they were just painted by hand. Uh, once the fabric was all laid out, they would take a roller or a paintbrush or whatever, and they would just paint over the fabric with, you'll see a brown, you'll see a shade of green, and then you'll also see a lighter shade of green here. So things you want to look for when looking for a Denison smock are correct Nui press studs. Uh, this is, I guess, a 60s, uh, manufacturer of the, the Nui. Um, and you want an, a 
somewhat of an original zipper. So look for new old stock or NOS if you're looking to buy stuff to modify your Denison or what have you. But newies are notorious among Denison collectors as the best button. Okay. And so if you turn around as well, there's a flap on the back of the Denison. That's also an iconic piece. Yeah. Uh, you currently have it attached to your side there. Um, so yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about, the, about that strap? Kind of a distinguishing factor of the Denison smock. Uh, a lot of the nicknames for the Paras came from the donkey tail. This was kind of known as one of the more popular uh, names for the, the boys would have been men with tails. Uh, it goes by the name of ape tail, donkey tail. So what it does, uh, besides look ridiculous, uh, it serves a functional purpose. So what happens is you hoist it up and you see these six buttons at the front. You hook it in here. And so when you parachute out of a C-47, you have a smock that will not balloon over your, your eyes, preventing you from seeing, yada, yada, yada. Great. Um, there's also two tabs on the side here to allow closure uh, to the smock to make it a bit more slim. Uh, but usually what was done, they would take the donkey tail and they would snap it here on the side and it's out of the way. All right, and do you have anything in the pockets? Oh yeah, I got lots of kit in there. Right here we have a original Australian made shell dressing. So you saw my reproduction shell dressing on my stand bandolier. Yep. This is a proper one, a original. It's dated, no dated November 1941. Uh, it's made by Johnson & Johnson. We got an oatmeal ration made by Clever Forgery, which is a Canadian manufacturer of rations. Um, I just have it here uh, just for a snack. Yeah, just for a little lunch. Uh, and then we have the clasp knife, a para item. So it's a knife. It's a kind of a multi-tool can opener, some other knives. And this one is a reproduction from What Price Glory. Not a bad reproduction. And then there's this little spike. And it's attached on a lanyard, right? Yeah, so this lanyard's original, apparently, from Second World War, and it feeds up and it goes underneath the epaulette here, and it just goes in any of the pockets. You can see it on the interior pockets here, you can see it in the top pockets or bottom pockets, doesn't matter. And why would you want it on a lanyard? Um, if you're, again, stuck in a tree, very plausible scenario, that you're parachuting in the dark, um, and you get caught in that tree and your risers are hanging above you, which are your strings connecting you to that parachute, um, you can use this in a hurry and not lose it. Uh, and if it does fall, it's on a lanyard, it's not going to go anywhere, and you can cut the risers above you and fall back down. Great. So in this left pocket here, we have a airborne recognition scarf. This is a reproduction from some Soldier of Fortune, and it gets, you can wear it on you, like it's a necktie, or not a necktie, but a thing around your neck. Uh, you can tie it around your leg, you can do whatever you want. You can even put it over your pack. There's two loops here that feed through the small pack uh, hooks, and you can wear it over your pack if you want to be recognized as a friendly from the air. So it's a very universal, universally agreed upon, very useful piece of kit. Okay. Uh, we also have an original 1943 Luftschultz German bandage. So it's a very, it's just a, just a plain white bandage, I assume. I haven't opened it. I don't really want to, but definitely gives the impression of a in-combat soldier having the enemy's items. Yep. It's a very cheap way of filling out the pockets, and it's also correct. So here I have a chocolate bar made from a 24-hour uh, ration pack mold that I bought on eBay. Um, it's, it's just raisin chocolate, so it's just dark chocolate with raisins in it. If you like dark chocolate, Right up your alley, you like raisins, perfect. Uh, we also have a Kit Kat bar. Nice. You know, yeah, you gotta you gotta fill out your pockets with some goodies. Yeah, that's right. So this is a another reproduction made by Clever Forgery. Bingo, bango. Perfect. Perfect. And you got the two top pockets as well? Yep. So my top left pocket, I have a pair of wool gloves. Um, apparently June of 1944 was rather cold. Um, good piece of kit to have especially if you're playing in kind of a colder climate they're um, made obviously from wool and they are from what price glory 
very good glove. I also have some paper items. Just some more small things to kind of fill out the impression a little bit more. And inside here, I also have a pack of dominoes. Just, you know, you're in the, you're in a foxhole or whatever, you gotta break up the dominoes with your buds and just have a couple games, you know, something to pass the time. So last but not least, we have the top right pocket and we have electrical tape and friction tape. Friction tape in a modern context is <clears throat> just hockey tape. You know, you can buy these store-bought anywhere, really. And I also have, oh boy, oh yeah. Percussion caps. This is a tin for percussion caps for demolition charges. So if you want to blow up something a bit more bulky, like a bunker or something, a gamma bomb can't cut it. Just use it's empty, but it's original. Uh, you would use these as the last percussion caps to set off the fuse and trigger the explosion. And then last but not least, pack of cards. Oh yeah, we got a map here. So you can fit a lot of kit in this Denison, which is good because you want a lot of kit because the boys had a lot of kit. Yeah, and they wouldn't have had any like resupply at that at that you know initial point of exactly jump off, right. Yep. So carry what you can, make room for snacks. You'll need it, and you got to have some sort of entertainment. Great. So now we're gonna take a look at underneath. But before we get there, well, what's this about? Oh yeah, this is the uh, a scrim scarf. Um, not not universal for the paras, but it's kind of a more uh, common piece of kit to see in British reenactors. A lot of original photographs depict the fellas with this type of scarf. You can have it, you cannot have it. I mean, it's up to you, really. I just choose to have it because it's functional and it conce conceals my neck when I go with the modern kit. Great. So this is the Denison off. It actually, it's not that light. It actually weighs a fair amount, right? No, yeah. This I think this particular reproduction is made from a canvas material. Okay. Uh, so that does not breathe whatsoever. Yeah, totally. All right. So you're wearing... Your the 1939 pattern battle dress. All right. So the tunic, uh, the serge tunic, uh, top, whatever you want to call it, is original. Um, this is dated April of 1945, made by the popular Canadian manufacturer Tip Top Tailor. So that's uh, it's kind of cool to see. They have a lineage that goes back to making BDs. Known, that's what they're known as. Um, so inside here, I have uh, a staple item for any reenactor. Uh, it's a Canadian Army Soldier's Service and Pay Book. If you didn't have this on your person at the time a military police member came up to you, you could be charged. So it's a very valuable kit to have. Uh, it's also made by Clever Forgery on Facebook. I think the only person on the market making a Canadian Pay Book. So we go back to the trousers here. Uh, inside here we have the first field dressing. Again, this is a uh, Australian example. Virtually exactly the same to British and Canadians. Uh, this one's dated November 1942. Uh, a nice piece of kit to have. Usually this would go in here. Uh, for whatever reason, I can't fit this one in. So I just, have, just keep it in a pocket. And then in my large front pocket um, of the Pattern 39 battle dress is a cap comforter. So this is a hat that's had a long service history in the first starting in the First World War, moving up to the Second World War, uh, and used up until today still by commando units and regular British Army units. Oh wow! So uh, when you get it, this is from What Price Glory. Um, it comes out to be this big scarf, but you just feed it on through, and you have yourself a little hat. It's all wool, really comfortable. Um, Great, great piece of kit to have. And I know uh, below camera you can't really see. I'll just describe. So you were wearing uh, what I would call gaiters, I guess, and then your yep. uh, your boots. Yeah, they're original gaiters, uh, the size three. So the way they work is um, they measure your calf size and your boot size to kind of roughly get the right size for a gaiter. Mine are just a tad too small, uh, so I guess I need a size four. Uh, but they're on top of... Canadian ammo boots. Ammo boots have, are the standard issue boot of the British or Canadian soldier or Australian, I mean, any Commonwealth nation really. Uh, the difference between the Canadian and the British is there's no toe cap. So um, if you've seen a jump boot, like the American jump boot, that has a toe cap that goes around the front or a British ammo boot that just has a, a cap going around the toe. They're hobnailed, so they have metal innards inside them, metal studs and a horseshoe on the heel and a toe cap. No traction whatsoever. Uh, so going uphill is a challenge and a half. 
They're not comfortable, but they look cool. And that's all that matters. Great. Um, and then in addition to this, you're also wearing the correct undergarments, right? Yeah. Underneath the battle dress, I have... Don't make it easy to get on and off. In a no, bunch. definitely not. I have the standard issue wool undershirt. Again, this is from Soldier of Fortune. I should say that the pants are Dutch post-war, uh, dated 1953, I think. They've just been converted to pattern 37, so they have the fuel dressing pocket, and the, the pocket, I think, on the, the left is a bit bigger. Over top of the service shirt, I have two identity discs, known in the American Ar Army as dog tags. So on mine, I have them outfitted to myself, so it has a service number, my initials, my last name, and CND, which stands for Canada. Um, so every Canadian soldier would have been given a pair of these. Essentially these are, this is what a battle dress soldier would look like. And you got suspenders too? Yep, I have two braces, or uh, one pair of braces that uh, are repros from What Price Glory. Uh, that's the only, that and the undershirt are the only reproductions that I wear, except for the boots uh, on my person. Uh, the shoulder flashes are from Old Times Design Company, and they are the correct issued flash for a Canadian or British 6th Army parachutist from D-Day. So they have the Airborne, the Pegasus, and then the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, uh, all very standard issued things. Um, on the shoulders here, on the epaulets, you, you see these two yellow slide-ons, I suppose. Uh, that just indicates you're a Canadian parachutist. Great. So just identi identification. All right, so let's get that pack open, see what you got in there. Sure, yeah. So on the front here, uh, I have a, the brown enamel mug, a reproduction from What Price Glory with an original brace on it. <clears throat> that brace is there just to dampen any noise or clutter because it is a tin mug. Yep. So right here on the outset, we have the ground sheet. So uh, when you would be packed up and ready to get like, out of camp, you would uh, set that down, you would lie on that. Next item, Tommy Cooker, which is a fuel source to cook your rations in. So on the front, we have uh, Canadian Army Mess Tin Ration. This is not historically accurate for the paras. This would have been used post-invasion uh, for the ground infantry. So in this uh, bag uh, is the larger mess tin, and that houses the 24-hour ration pack. Um, next to that, we have a shoe brush. We have an original 1940 dated Canadian housewife kit, which is a sewing kit. Uh, we have a emergency ration tin with a bar of chocolate, because that's what would have been used. Emergency ration is only to be uh, eaten and consumed on an officer's order. So when there's no supply in and you need food, the officer would give that, and that's vitamin rich chocolate. Some original uh, 1940 dated foot powder. Um, and a block of Blanco, original, and uh, we have a housewife kit, uh, uh, wash roll, sorry. So this wash roll is fully loaded with all the toiletry needs that you could have. We have cloth, it's made by Old Time Design Company, a shaving brush, a bar of soap, two original razors, a shave brush, or sa shave soap, sorry, uh, reproduction razor, uh, a mirror, a fork, some toothpaste, a uh, toothbrush, original Canadian comb, and some extra boot laces. So you're probably asking yourself if the rations are filled, and my answer is of course they are. Yep. So they are treated with wax impregnation, so they're waterproof and they are anti-gas proof. So these are not historically correct. So right off the, that's the 24 hour ration pack. We have latrine paper, salt, biscuits, which are not correct, uh, bouillon cubes, which is just soup, uh, if you've seen Steve 1989, you'll know what bouillon is. Two chocolate bars, a vitamin enriched one, and a raisin chocolate one made from molds. Uh, so yeah, we have the two tea rations, uh, we have milk powder, and we also have some boiled sweets. These are just all store-bought items. And the biggest offender of all is this tinned ham. 24-hour ration pack did not have any tins of any sort. They had a dehydrated cube of lamb, beef, and pork, I think. A cube of that with celery salt. Another thing to note is there should be two oatmeal bars in here, which is not oatmeal, but oat bars. Um, that's missing. I, I ate those. The, my girlfriend made those, so. Great. Uh, and that is pr essentially the kit. So I guess one other thing I can talk about is the 
the, the housewife kit because it is an interesting piece of kit, I think. It contains buttons and a thimble. We got some original needles and we got lots of thread. Original Canadian thread here, reproduction US thread, and some wool thread. Yeah, it's a very cool piece of kit. Really, I mean, historically accurate because lots of field damage does occur when you're in combat. So the ability to repair is essential, I think. And it's one thing that reenactors kind of skimp out on, but it's a really valuable piece of kit that sets your impression over the edge. Perfect. So guys, if you've made it this far, clearly you're obviously really interested in World War II. Thank you so much for uh, sticking with us. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of kit. I think John has put so much uh, effort, uh, money aside, there's so much effort and attention to detail uh, throughout this whole kit. Uh, I know it's something that you've been really passionate about. You've got uh, a couple of other kits as well that have a pretty fleshed out detail. Uh, guys, if you like this video, make sure to let us know in the comments because we would like to keep making similar types of content uh, if that's something you find interesting. Uh, John, thank you so much for walking through your kit. Guys, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.